Anyway, we'll go to Deuteronomy chapter 7. Deuteronomy chapter 7. Before we read any Scriptures, I'm going to... Uh, this message tonight, by the way, is in honor of Hanukkah. We are right in the middle of Hanukkah right now. And uh, so I wanted to do something to honor Hanukkah tonight. And I thought this would be a good message for that. And the title of this message is God's Chosen People. Okay, God's Chosen People. There's some debate out there on who God's chosen people are. And if you look at the Scripture, it's not vague. It's crystal clear who the chosen people are. I mean, it is crystal clear, black and white, this isn't my interpretation. This is basically just English, okay? Yeah, and we're—I mean, it's just some of these things are spelled out. And so, as way of introduction, uh, and I encourage you to maybe take some notes on this. Uh, this message might be a good idea to mark some of these scriptures down because if you dare to repeat anything I say, you better have some Bible to back it up because you will be met with some great hostility, more than likely. And so you need to be able to show people from the Scripture. And listen, I'm telling you right now, I would not dare say the next three things I'm about to say unless I didn't have some black and white Scripture that was crystal clear. Alright? And so, <clears throat> y'all have to promise no throwing anything at me after I say these. No walking out. When I get to the end of the message, if I haven't showed you from the Bible, walk out. You don't even throw stuff at me. Okay? Uh, that, that'll be fine. If at the end of this message you don't see it. But first off, one, number one, the Jews today are not God's chosen people. Secondly, the Israel of today will not make it into the millennial kingdom. Thirdly, and this is the one where I got my shield ready to go, shield of faith, it's invisible, but it's here. The geographical location of Israel does not belong to the Jews. I, I, I'm telling, and wow, you know that's those are pretty big claims. But I'm telling you, I'm going to show you black and white scripture that completely backs this up. And I'm going to, I want to start off by saying, I don't hate Jews at all. I've grown up loving Jews. I was grown, I was always been taught to love the Jews. And you know what? I think it's appropriate to love the Jews. But you know, I think we ought to love the Muslims too. I think we ought to love all people and we ought to try to get the Gospel message of Jesus Christ to everyone. So this is not a message of hate at all. This is a message of love because it's truth. And if you love people, you're going to tell them the truth. And so, first off, but what we're going to look at tonight, because I've done a ton of study on this subject over the past couple of years, and I thought, how can I put all of this in one message? Because I just made some huge claims that would make a lot of people mad. And so I thought, how can I show people, how can I prove this from the Scripture in one message? If I go a few minutes over, and I hope you all won't get mad at me for that either. I'll probably get you more mad at me for that than anything else. But I want to show you these Scriptures. I want to get this across, and I've got... I've got my regular points, but then I've got some bonus points that we might get into. I've got bonus points just to kind of help uh, with this. We might not get through all of them because, like I said, I've done a lot of study on this subject. But first of all, God's chosen people. Okay, I've, I just unsubscribed to an email uh, that comes to me all the time from a chosen people's ministries, and they're Christians, and it's about these ministries of the Jews and things. And I'm 100 percent for ministries of the Jews. They need the gospel. Okay, they've been they're deceived right now. They need the gospel. It needs to be true, but it keeps calling them God's chosen people. And the Bible is crystal clear on who the chosen people are. I mean, just crystal, crystal clear. But first off, chosen, well, what does that even mean? Does it mean that they're the chosen race? As if there's a priority based on race? I mean, what does that mean to be chosen? And if you read, if you go through the Bible and you look at every time the word chosen is used, whether it was chosen for a specific task, chosen for a purpose, there's always something that they're chosen for. Another word, we might get into some of these tonight, is the term elect. You've heard the term elect before. In the election, you see that a lot in the New Testament. Well, the term elect it basically means the same thing. Just like we elect a president, for example, or elect a governor, when we elect them, we're not electing them so they can be called the elect, Right? We elect them for a purpose. We elect them to be president. We elect them to be governor or whatever it is. And whenever God chose somebody 
He chose them for a specific purpose. And so if you say God's chosen people, okay, well, what did He choose them for? And where, and you see throughout the Old Testament that clearly the Jews, the Israelites, were God's chosen people. But what were they chosen for? And that's very important. And when we look at what they were chosen for, you're going to, this passage is going to be eerily familiar with some New Testament passages. So go to Deuteronomy chapter 7 and verse 6, and we are going to blow your mind with what you see here tonight. So nobody. Nobody walk out on me. Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 6. For thou art an holy people unto the Lord thy God. For, and the Lord thy God hath chosen thee to be a special people unto Himself above all people that are upon the face of the earth. All right, that's pretty clear there, isn't it? He's talking to the children of Israel right here. The Lord did not set His love upon you, nor choose you because ye were more in number than any people, for ye were the fewest of all people. But because the Lord loved you and because He would keep the oath which He had sworn unto your fathers, hath the Lord brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you out of the house of bondmen from the hand of Pharaoh king of Egypt. Know therefore that the Lord thy God, He is God, the faithful God, which keepeth covenant and mercy with them that love Him and keep His commandments to a thousand generations, okay, and repayeth them that hate him to their face and destroy them. He will not be slack to him that hateth him. He will repay him to his face. Thou shalt therefore keep the commandments and the statutes and the judgments which I command thee this day to do them. Wherefore it shall come to pass if ye hearken to do these judgments and keep and do them that the Lord thy God shall keep unto thee the covenant and the mercy which he swear unto thy fathers. We're going to stop reading right there. But these verses that we read, you will hear part of this passage a lot from people claiming that the Jews are still God's chosen people. And they will use the verse 2 where it says He keep uh, you know, His commandments to a thousand generations. That this was an everlasting, it was a, it was a never-ending covenant, and it was. Okay, But we didn't read the whole covenant. By the way, and we will get to the rest of it later. But first what I want you to see here, because remember, in the Bible, when they were chosen, it was for a purpose. For example, we don't have time to look at all the passages, but Jerusalem, it was the chosen city. In 1 Kings chapter 11, in verse 36, uh, it says, And unto his son will I give one tribe, that David my servant may have a light alway before me. In Jerusalem, the city which I have chosen to put my name there. That was the city God chose to put His name there. And you can see that again many times in Scripture. 2 Kings 21.7 He set a graven image on the grove that He had made in the house which the Lord said to David and to Solomon his son in this house and in Jerusalem which I have chosen out of all the tribes of Israel will I put My name there forever. So Jerusalem was the chosen city. What was it chosen for? It was chosen as a place where God would put His name forever. Also, in John chapter 15, verse 15 through 20, Jesus is talking to his disciples, and he said to them, Ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you, and ordained you that you should go and bring forth fruit. Jesus Christ, uh, his disciples were chosen ones. Well, chosen for what? Chosen to be his disciples. There was a specific, there was something specific that God chose them for, and God chose the Israelites. For a purpose. He chose them for a specific reason. And what was that? Well, in verse 6, look at it again. And, and then we're going to look at it because this verse is very familiar and very, uh, it sounds a lot like one we see in the New Testament we're going to look at. But in verse 6, for thou art an holy people unto the Lord thy God. The Lord thy God hath chosen thee to be a special people unto himself above all the people that are upon the face of the earth. Okay, now, Take your Bibles and turn over to 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 9. So the Jews, they're a special people. They're all holy people. I know they're not worshiping God right now. I know they're not worshiping the Messiah, but they're still chosen. They're still special. Are, we, are they still holy? <laughs> I mean, it doesn't look like it when you see what's going on over there right now. But look at what 1 Peter chapter 2 verse 9 says. This is very familiar. But ye are a chosen generation a royal priesthood and holy nation, a peculiar people. And you know what peculiar means? It doesn't mean strange or weird, but it's something that's 
chosen for a specific purpose, something that is set apart specifically for God. A peculiar people that ye should show forth the praises of Him who hath called you out of darkness into His marvelous light, which in times past were not a people, but are now the people of God, which have not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshy, fleshly lusts which war against the soul. Notice what he said there. Who do you think he's talking to here? We're in the New Testament. He's talking to Christians. He said, ye are a chosen generation. A royal priesthood. A holy nation. Very similar to what he said there that now as Christians, we're a holy nation. A holy nation. Did you hear that? A holy nation. What, well, what nation are we a part of now? Well, I don't think God, when he talked about a holy nation, I don't think he was talking about the United States of America. Okay, we have a dual citizenship, don't we? Okay, we're citizens of America, but we're citizens of Jerusalem or the heavenly Jerusalem, aren't we? We are a holy nation. We are a peculiar people. I mean, chosen. Right there it said, a chosen generation. So how can we not say that we're not the chosen ones? He just said right there, talking to Christians, very similar to what he said, the Israelites were supposed to be a holy people, one that followed God's commands. That's what they were chosen for. And, well, that didn't go so well, and we'll look into that in a little bit. So, they were chosen to be a holy and a special people to himself. And we see in the New Testament, God says the exact same thing about us as Christians. So then, if you go to also, they were to love the Lord and to keep His commandments. Look at verse 9. Know therefore that the Lord thy God, He is God, the faithful God, which keepeth covenant and mercy with them that love Him and keep His commandments to a thousand generations and repayeth them that hate Him to their face to destroy them. He will not be slack to him that hateth Him. He will repay Him to His face. Now, what does the Bible... If, if you love me, keep my commandments. You know, if you, if you love God, you keep His commandments. If you hate Him, you don't obey His commandments, right? And God repays those who hate Him. He repays them to their face. Verse 11, Thou shalt therefore keep the commandments and the statutes and the judgments which I command thee this day to do them. Wherefore it shall come to pass if ye hearken to these judgments and keep and do them, that the Lord thy God shall keep unto thee the covenant and mercy which ye swear unto thy fathers. So right there, we see that they were chosen to love the Lord and keep His commandments. They were the ones He gave His commandments to. God didn't give the commandments. He didn't give the law to the Canaanites. He didn't give the law to the Edomites or any of the other people that were out there. He gave it to the children of Israel. And they were chosen to be the ones who loved the Lord and would keep His commandments. That's what He chose them for. And look at 1 John chapter 5, and verse 2. We see another... Scripture that is very similar to the one we just read in Deuteronomy. 1 John chapter 5 and verse 2. It says, By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep His commandments. For this is the love of God that we keep His commandments and His commandments are not grievous. So, they were chosen to keep His commandments. And we see also in the New Testament that God has told us the exact same thing. We're to keep His commandments. If you love Me, keep My commandments. I mean, there's many Scriptures where God says the exact same thing for us as Christians. We're supposed to keep His commandments, aren't we? Us, as His chosen people, that's what we're supposed to do. We don't keep His commandments so we can get saved. We keep His commandments because we are saved. Because we are the chosen people. Because He chose us. Because He saved us. Because He loved us. And we are supposed to keep His commandments. And the Bible says, we love Him when we keep His commandments. Now let me ask you, if somebody is rejecting Jesus Christ as Messiah, are they loving Him? No. That's Are they hating Him? Yes. They are. So... I don't, you know, specifically, that's what they were chosen for, to be a holy people, special people. We see that is told to us as Christians in the New Testament. They were to love the Lord and keep His commandments. That exact same thing is told to us as Christians in the New Testament. And then, the, another reason too, and this is a big one that people want to bring up, and I'm telling you, this one here, boy, it's so clear. It's so black and white. We're, the Israelites, they were chosen because 
of God's covenant with Abraham. Verse 7, Deuteronomy 7, The Lord did not set His love upon you, nor choose you, because ye were more in number than any people, for ye were the fewest of all people, but because the Lord loved you, and because He would keep the oath which He had sworn unto your fathers. Talking about Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. God was keeping His oath that He gave them. That's why He chose them. To keep the promise of he made to Abraham. Well, what was that promise? Well, let's go take a look. Because this is a passage of Scripture that everybody likes to use a part of it. Just a part of it, the part they like. But go to Genesis chapter 12. Genesis chapter 12, I'm telling you, this is where it's going to start really getting crystal clear. Genesis chapter 12, verse 1. Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee. And I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee. And in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Did you all hear that, folks? I will bless them that bless thee, curse them that curseth thee. Okay? You don't mess with the Jews, folks, because you know God blesses those that bless them and curses those who curse them. All right, that's the promise of Abraham, and it goes to all generations. Well, let's keep on reading. So Abram departed as the Lord had spoken unto him, and Lot went with him. And Abram was seventy and five years old when he departed out of Haran. And Abram took Sarai his wife, and Lot his brother's son, and all their substance that they had gathered, and the souls that they had gotten in Haran. And they went forth to go into the land of Canaan. And into the land of Canaan they came. And Abram passed through the land of the place of Sychem, under the plain of Moriah, and the Canaanite was then in the land. And the Lord appeared unto Abram and said, Unto thy seed will I give this land. And there builded he an altar unto the Lord who appeared unto them. Did you all hear that, folks? Now, I made a big statement earlier. I said the geographical location of Israel does not belong to the Jews. But it says he's going to give it to his seed. But notice it says seed not seeds. Oh, you're stretching that, brother Tommy. No, you know he means he's talking about you know his descendants. Yeah, but wait, no, you know you're you're pushing it. No, actually, I'm not. And it can be proved as black and white as it gets in Galatians chapter three. Turn over to Galatians chapter three. Galatians chapter three. And you know what? We have politicians today that are always talking about how you know Israel belongs to the Jews, and some of them will even quote Genesis uh, chapter twelve. I mean, preachers do it all the time. They'll quote Genesis chapter twelve, verse seven. They use it all the time. But let's read Galatians three. Nobody brings up Galatians three. You say, brother Tommy, are you saying the Muslims should get it? No, it doesn't belong to the Muslims either. And we're going to find out who it belongs to. Galatians chapter three, verse six. Even as Abraham believed God, and it was accounted unto him for righteousness. Know ye therefore that they which are of faith, the same are the children of Abraham. Well, that sounds kind of like us, doesn't it? They that are of faith are the children of Abraham. All right, let's keep reading. And the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the heathen, that's us, through faith, preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, In thee shall all nations be blessed. And now I forgot, you know, after you read that passage in Genesis chapter 12, you're supposed to tell a story about how the Jews have been a blessing to America. That's what you're supposed to do. And that verse was prophetic of that. But he's not talking about Jews being a blessing, it's talking about Jesus Christ. And those will keep reading. So then they which be of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse, for it is written, Cursed is every one that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. But that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God, it is evident, for the just shall live by faith. And the law is not of faith, but the man that doeth them shall live in them. Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is every one that hangeth on a tree. That the blessing of Abraham, that's Genesis chapter 12 that we were looking at, uh, it, that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Brethren, 
I speak after the manner of men, though it be but a man's covenant, yet if it be confirmed, no man disannulleth or addeth thereto. Now here's the part where it just confirms. When I said seed, it was talking seed singular. Talking about Jesus Christ. Not seeds. Right here. Verse 16, Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He saith not, and to seeds as of many, but as of one. And to thy seed, which is Christ. Do you see that there? It wasn't talking about seeds. It just flat out told us. It's not talking about seeds as of many, but one. That verse, Genesis, or Genesis chapter, uh, where was it? Chapter 12, verse 7. That was talking about Jesus Christ. It confirms it. In Galatians chapter 3, and this I say that the covenant that was confirmed before of God in Christ the law, which was 430 years after, cannot disannul that it should make the promise of none effect. For if the inheritance be of the law, it is no more a promise, but God gave it to Abraham by promise. Wherefore then serve the law, it was added because of transgressions till the seed should come to whom the promise was made, the seed should come. But the promise was made. It was promised to His seed. Jesus Christ. And it was ordained by angels in the hand of a mediator. Now a mediator is not a mediator of one, but God is one. Is the law then against the promises of God? God forbid. For if there had been a law given which could have given life, verily righteousness should have been by the law. But the Scripture hath concluded all under sin that the promise of faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. But before faith came, we were kept under the law, shut up under faith, which should afterwards be revealed. Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ that we might be justified by faith. But after that faith is come, we are no longer under schoolmaster. For ye are all children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female. For ye are all one in Christ. And if ye be Christ, then are ye... Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. If you're in Christ, you're Abraham's seed. Did you all hear that? Now, if I'm Jewish and I don't believe in Christ, am I saved? If I'm if I'm not saved, am I the seed of Abraham? Absolutely not. So, who does the land of Israel belong to today? It belongs to the seed of Abraham, Jesus Christ. It belongs to him. And to us as Christians. Now I'm not going to go over and get it right now because uh, I haven't got I haven't got the weaponry and things that I would need to do that. But here's the thing: the one that really belongs to that I'm just a joint heir with is going to come back to get it one of these days, isn't he? At Armageddon, and he's going to go and he's going to defeat the armies with the word of his mouth, and he's going to set up his kingdom there because that is his land. And if we are joint heirs with Christ then it's ours too. So you know, in the meantime, I'm going to let the Jews and the Muslims fight over it. Okay? I'm going to let them fight over it. I'm not, I'm not getting involved. Uh, they got more powerful uh, weapons than I do. I get killed real fast. And, and you know what? I mean, we, do, we have preachers and politicians that want to wave their Bible in Washington and misuse the Scripture to prove that it belongs to the Jews. Well, you know, if we're so brave, they're so confident, why don't they go... Do it over there in Israel to the Muslims, you know. It really matters. They're going to shoot the Bible right out of their hand and they're going to shoot them in the face, aren't they? They're going to blow them up because you're not going to get away with that. But, I mean, the Bible is just, it's black and white right there, folks, that it belongs to the seed of Abraham. And that seed is Jesus Christ. And so I, I, I think that proves it. I think we could shut it down right here, but no, we will. Uh, we're going to give you, we're going to, we're going to keep on going. So here's the thing, though. Can Israel be saved? Can Israel be saved? Well, yes. Absolutely. Go to Romans chapter 11. Now, I know we got a lot of Scripture we're going to look at tonight. But there's a lot more we could have looked at. But I want us to go through this chapter because we need to read the whole chapter because people pick out bits and pieces of this chapter to give a false idea. And I want us to look at the whole chapter because it's very clear. Because you know, you got guys out there, you know, you got... You got Pastor Pompous that wants to get up, or Doctor Pompous will call him that just wants to get up and let you know the Jews are still God's chosen people. You know God has not cast away Israel, 
and he then he tells you about how many degrees he has and how smart he is, and you know, and he proves it from this scripture here. But let's read his scripture, and we're going to keep on reading where he stopped, where Doctor Pompus stops. We're going to keep on reading, and look what it says. I say then, has God cast away His people? Talking about the Jews. God forbid. For I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham of the tribe of Benjamin. Now they'll usually just read that first part that God cast away His people. God forbid. No, God's not done with Israel. But let's keep reading. And then and it will tell you too, you know, God's going to do this revival with the Jews. All that's going to happen. But let's keep reading. What's He talking about here? He says, no, He says, I'm an Israelite of the seed of Abraham of the tribe of Benjamin. God hath not cast away His people which He foreknew. Why ye not what the Scriptures say for the liars, how He maketh intercession to God against Israel, saying, Lord, they have killed Thy prophets and dig down Thine altars, and I am left alone, and they seek My life. But what saith the answer of God unto him? I have reserved to Myself seven thousand men who have not bowed the knee to the image of Baal. Even so then, at this present time also, there is a remnant according to the election of grace. You see what it's saying here, folks? When it says, God forbid, you know, He's not cast away His people, he, Paul didn't say that because God was going to do this great work later with them. He said, God forbid, because I'm an Israelite. I'm of the tribe of Benjamin. God hasn't cast away His people. He saved me. And while it seems like He has... He used the story of Elijah as an example when Jezebel was coming after him and Jezebel was wanting to kill him. And he's thinking, I'm alone. He said, I'm the only one that's doing right. And God said, no, you're not. There's, what was it, 7,000 that hadn't bowed the knee to Baal? There was a remnant. There was still some that were doing right. And you know what? Even today, there are physical descendants of Abraham who are saved. Thank God there are people who have come out of Judaism, they heard the Gospel, they received Jesus Christ as their Savior, and they're saved today. There are saved Jews today. Why Why did God save them? Because God hasn't cast away His people. He will still save them if they will call on Him for salvation. And then let's keep on reading because there's a lot more in here. And if grace uh, by grace, then it is no more of works, otherwise grace is no more grace. But if it be works, then is it no more grace, otherwise work is no more work. What then? Israel hath not obtained that which he seeketh for, but the election hath obtained it, and the rest were blinded. The election. Once again, the chosen ones. Who are the chosen? Those who are saved. Those who believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. If you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, you are the election. You are the saved. Okay? And it wasn't because God picked you before the foundation of the earth. It's because before the foundation of the earth, God planned and it was God's purpose that whoever believed in Him would be saved. And if that's you, if you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, you're saved. You're a part of the elect. And if it, whether it was Old Testament saints that happened to be Jews, they are a part of the elect. But there was unbelieving Jews. They were not part of the elect. They were not part of the chosen. And then verse eight. According as it is written, God hath given them the spirit of slumber, eyes that they should not see, and ears that they should not hear unto this day. But one of these days, they're going to wake up. One of these days, they're going to figure out that they killed their Messiah after the rapture comes and takes all the Christians out and they find all those Bibles that people gave them. They're going to read them and figure it out. Well, let's keep reading because I made the claim too that they're not going into the Millennial Kingdom. And we'll see where that comes from. And David saith, Let their table be made a snare and a trap and a stumbling block and a recompense unto them. Let their eyes be darkened that they may not see and bow down their back always. I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? God forbid. But rather, through their fall, salvation has come unto the Gentiles for to provoke them to jealousy. God, that, us getting saved, God using us, is supposed to provoke them to jealousy and cause them to call on Christ. Now it says, Now if the fall of them be the riches of the world and the diminishing of them the riches of the Gentiles, how much more their fullness? For I speak to you Gentiles inasmuch as I am the apostle of the Gentiles, I magnify mine office. If I by any means I may provoke to emulation them which are my flesh and might save some of them. For if the casting away of them be the reconciling of the world, what shall be the receiving of them be but life from the dead? Basically, if they get saved, they're going to get saved the same way you and I. Life from the dead. For if the first fruit be holy, the lump is also holy. And if the root be holy, so are the branches. And if some of the branches be broken off, 
And thou, being a wild olive tree, that's you and I, the Gentiles, were grafted in among them. Okay? See, I'm not talking about replacement theology. Okay, replacement theology, I mean, that's a bad word amongst Baptists. That's taboo. I'm not saying we replace the Jews. I'm saying we've basically joined in with them. We are, we, as a wild olive tree, we've been grafted in to the same root that they were. And it says, Thou wilt say then the branches were broken off that I might be grafted in. Well, because of unbelief they were broken off. And thou standest by faith. Be not high-minded, but fear. For if God spare not the natural branches, take heed lest He also spare not thee. Behold therefore the goodness and severity of God on them which fell severity. But toward thee goodness, if thou continue in His goodness, otherwise thou shalt be cut off. And they also, if they abide not still in unbelief, shall be grafted in. For God is able to graft them in again. And people will say that that's because God's going to that's prophetic. God's going to graft them in again. Well, you say if they'll believe, they will be grafted in. Just like us, when we got saved, we got grafted in. If they would get saved, they would be grafted back in too. Okay, that's all it's saying. This isn't anything prophetic. I mean, this is present. If they would get saved, they would be grafted in. They would be a part of the same tree. For if thou wert cut out of the olive tree, which is wild by nature, and wert grafted contrary to nature into a good olive tree, how much more shall these, which be the natural branches, be grafted in to their own olive tree? For I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery, lest ye should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part is happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. And so all Israel shall be saved as it is written, there shall come out of Zion the Deliverer and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. For this is My covenant unto them that I will take away their sins. As concerning the Gospel, they are enemies for your sakes, but as touching the election, they are beloved for the Father's sake. Okay, The election. As the election. Those that are saved, those that are going to get saved, they're beloved of the Father's sake. Just like you and I are, are beloved. And then it says, for the gifts and calling of God are without repentance. So I'll use to say they're still the chosen people because God doesn't change His mind. And you know what? They're right. He doesn't change His mind. And He, did, he hasn't changed His mind. He hasn't gone against His covenant. And I'm going to show you that in just a minute. God hasn't changed a single thing. If they call on Him, they will get saved. And you say, but you're saying the Jews aren't the chosen people. That means that God had to break His covenant. No, He didn't break His covenant. And I'll show you that. But let's go through the rest of this chapter. For as ye in times past have not believed God, yet have now obtained mercy through their unbelief, even so have these also now not believed that through your mercy they also may obtain mercy. For God hath concluded them all in unbelief that He might have mercy upon all. Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable are His judgments and His ways, past finding out. For who hath known the mind of the Lord, or who hath been His counselor, or who hath first given to Him, and it shall be recompensed unto Him again. For of Him and through Him and to Him are all things, to whom be glory forever. I mean, we see a great passage here. Just showing us basically, to sum this whole chapter up, it's basically saying Israel, Jews, Israelites, Jews, can still be saved. Just just like God allowed us to be grafted in, He could just as easily take them who by nature were the natural branches and He could graft them back in too. But right now, He's concluded them all in unbelief. Just like you and I. At one time, we didn't believe. But then we believed and got saved. And if they will believe, they will get saved. Once again, in harmony with... There is no difference between Jew or Greek. I don't know what it is with this generation and its obsession with race. Why? I don't understand it. I, you know, I do understand the world being that way. They're using it to divide. They're using it to cause contention. But why do we fall for it as Christians? Why do we make such a big deal about race? I mean, some of the stuff people come up with. You know, I heard one preacher. He was preaching one time, and he was saying that descendants of Shem should not marry the descendants of Japheth or. Uh, Ham, but those there's three groups, and those groups aren't ever to intermarry. And here's the reason why. Here's proof of it from the scriptures. After they separated the Tower of Babel, God divided the areas that the different groups by water, and that's a symbol of separation. And so we're not supposed to marry them. I don't know, you're looking at me funny, and that's why I was looking when I heard that. I was like, the Bible doesn't say that's why He did that. 
I think they just got separated by water. You know, the families naturally went with each other. And it's just goofy, especially because in the New Testament, we see that there is no difference. Basically, what's important is are you saved or are you lost? And saved people should not marry lost people. And that is very crystal clear in the Bible. Well, we don't see anything else. I mean, race we see is not a factor in the New Testament, especially when it has to do with salvation. So, we don't, we don't have time to go into the election and things. But I mean, so the election, it's always talking about the saved. Many times people say, oh, it's talking about the Jews. No, it's talking about the saved. If it's referring to the Jews, it's referring to saved Jews. And many times it's specifically referring to people who aren't Jews. So you can't say that. So what about that verse that we read, the gifts and callings of God or without repentance? Because God said He chose them. He chose it for a thousand generations. That hasn't been a thousand generations. Yep, God hasn't changed His mind. And yes, that's true. God hasn't changed His mind and His covenant. He didn't change His covenant. Let's go read the part that nobody wants to read on this covenant that He made with the children of Israel when He chose them. Verse 12, Wherefore it shall come to pass, we had read this verse, if ye hearken to these judgments and keep them and do them, that the Lord thy God shall keep unto thee the covenant and the mercy which He sware unto thy fathers. And He will love thee and bless thee and multiply thee. He will also bless the fruit of thy womb and the fruit of thy land, thy corn, thy wine, and thine oil, the increase of thy kind, and the flocks and thy sheep and the land which He sware unto thy fathers to give thee. Thou shalt be blessed above all people. There shall not be male or female barren among you or among your cattle. Do you notice verse 12? If you'll keep your part of the covenant. You know, there's two people involved in the covenant, is there? When you get married, okay, Daniel and Shelby, when you guys got married a while back, Okay, it would it would not have worked if Daniel would have been up here and he said I do, and then Shelby said I don't. That wouldn't have worked. We'd we'd had to shut it down right there. We wouldn't have been able to have a we wouldn't have been able to have a marriage. They've got to be in agreement. They have got to do their part. And when God made this covenant, He said in the covenant that you have to keep it and you you have to continually keep it. And if you don't keep it, then it's it's null and void. They had to do their part. They had to keep their commandments. They had to love God. And He told them many times, too, in the Scriptures, if they would keep it, you know, He would keep them in land. If they didn't, they would be driven out of the land. And they, and he, Mike, here's a question. We don't have time to go into it. But did they keep their covenant? Absolutely not. Well, show me where in the Bible we need to turn to to find that out. Well, let's start in the book of Joshua and let's work our way through Revelation. I mean, they didn't keep the covenant, did they? They kept getting in trouble. And you know, God would be merciful. God gave them chance after chance after chance. In the book of Judges, just over and over again, they're getting in trouble. They're not doing what they're supposed to do, but God kept forgiving them. He kept forgiving them. And then we see in First and Second Samuel and throughout the kings, they got in trouble. And then finally, they got taken captive in Babylon. And God and it was prophesied by Isaiah and Jeremiah before they got taken out that they were going to be taken captive. And one day, God was going to bring them all back to Israel. God was going to bring them back. There was going to be a regathering of Israel. And we don't have time to go into all the Scriptures of that, but people will tell you that, that those prophecies have yet to be fulfilled. That all these Jews going back to Israel today, this is the regathering of Israel. Boy, that, I mean, this is prophecy being fulfilled. No, the prophecy was fulfilled in Ezra and Nehemiah when they started coming back again and when they rebuilt their temple. And when God kept those promises and brought them back. He restored them. But... Did that last? Did they stay doing right? No. Because 400 years later, their Messiah showed up, didn't he? And what did they do to their Messiah? They rejected him. They killed him. They crucified him. He rose again from the dead, and they still didn't believe. And then when you read the book of Acts, you know, they're filled with the Holy Spirit. They're going and they're preaching the gospel. And who was it that was always fighting the Christians? It was the Jews. It was they rejected Christ. They didn't keep His commandments in the Old Testament. They rejected their Messiah in the New Testament. They rejected the Gospel message by the apostles and Acts and throughout the entire New Testament. And it says in the Bible that they are now Antichrist. 1 John chapter 2. We looked at this this morning. 1 John chapter 2. In verse 2, 
Oh wait, that's... Or verse 22, I'm sorry. Verse 22. Who is a liar? But he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ. He is Antichrist that denieth the Father and the Son. Whosoever denieth the Son, the same hath not the Father. But he, hath acknowledged, he that acknowledgeth the Son hath the Father also. Listen, if we're going to have a ministry to the Jews, it would be more accurate to call it not the chosen people ministry, but the Antichrist ministry. <clears throat> we're going to win Antichrist. Because, or the liar ministry. We're going to go and reach the liars. Now listen, the Jews aren't the only ones, folks. The Muslims deny that Jesus is the Christ. The, you know, the Jehovah's Witnesses, you know, they deny it. I mean, there's all kinds of liars out there. The atheists deny it. But anybody who does not believe that Jesus is the Christ is a liar, not a chosen person. They are not chosen people. They are a liar. The Bible says it. They are Antichrist. And you know what? If you want to go out and start a ministry to the Antichrist, not the Antichrist, but Antichrist, plural, hey, I'm all for you. I'll back you up 100%. They need to be one. And basically, that's what we're doing today is everyone who denies Jesus Christ, they're Antichrist. So we need to we need to get the Gospel to them. We need to show them that He is the Christ. But So God didn't change His mind. They God kept His part they didn't keep their part. They rejected His law. They rejected the Messiah. They rejected the payment for their sins. They rejected it all. And said, but there's a remnant. Okay, Thank God. Some get it. Some get saved. But Israel in general never kept their covenant. And Israel in general as a whole, or for the most part, they will never receive Christ according to the Bible. Jesus said they wouldn't. Go to John chapter 5, verse 39. Okay, now you can, so you can call, you know, people will say, no, they're going to. Well, then we're calling Jesus a liar. Look what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 39. Search the scriptures, for in them ye think ye shall have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. And ye will not come to me that ye might have life. I receive not honor from men, but I know you that ye have not the love of God in you. I am come in my Father's name, and ye receive me not. If another shall come in his own name, him will ye receive. And everyone agrees that's talking about the Antichrist. Everybody agrees with that. Everybody will tell you they're going to accept the Antichrist in the first half of the tribulation. And then after the abomination of desolation, they're going to figure out who he is. And then they're not, then they're going to figure it out and they're going to get saved. But then the same group, depending on what message they're preaching, will tell you they're all going to figure it out when the rapture comes. Well, if they're going to all figure it out when the rapture comes, then how are they going to receive him? Uh, I don't know. It doesn't make sense. They're going to, but what we do see, they're going to receive the one who comes in his own name. And then, uh, in verse 44, How can ye believe which receive honor one of another and seek not the honor of, that cometh from God only? Do not think that I will accuse you to the Father. There is one that accuseth you, even Moses, in whom ye trust. Talking about that Old Testament law. For had ye believed Moses, ye would have believed me, for he wrote of me. But ye believe not his writings, how she believe my words. Anybody who does not believe in Jesus Christ does not believe in the Old Testament. Don't tell me the Jews believe the Old Testament and not the New Testament. Jesus said if they believe Moses, they believe Me. They don't believe the Old Testament. Otherwise, they would believe in Jesus Christ. You can't believe in God and not believe in Christ. You can't believe in the Bible and not believe in Christ. So in general, Jesus said they're going to receive the Antichrist. And He specifically said in Matthew chapter 8 that they will not go into the kingdom. Matthew chapter 8. Now the remnant will. The elect will. Those who believe. Those who get saved. They will go into the kingdom. But as a whole, they're not going to. Matthew chapter 8 verse 5 says, And when Jesus was entered into Capernaum, there came unto him a centurion, beseeching him and saying, Lord, my servant lieth at home sick of the palsy, grievously tormented. This fellow is a Gentile. And Jesus saith unto him, I will come and heal him. The centurion answered and said, Lord, I am not worthy that thou shouldst come under my roof, but speak the word only, and my servant shall be healed. He was getting respect from this guy like he didn't get from the Jews. He was getting faith from this guy like he never got from the Jews. And he says, For I am a man under authority, having soldiers under me. And I say to this man, Go, and he goeth, and to another, Come, and he cometh, and to my servant, Do this, and he doeth it. When Jesus heard it, he marveled and said to them that followed, Verily I say unto you, I have not found so great faith, no, not in Israel. And I say unto you, 
that many shall come from the east and west and sit down with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the children of the kingdom, the children of the kingdom, the ch- talking about the children of Abraham. And if you don't think that's clear, I'll show you another verse that makes it clear. The children of the kingdom shall be cast out into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Jesus said the children of the kingdom, or basically the children of Abraham, will not go into the kingdom of God. Those from the east and the west, from the surrounding nations, they will go into the kingdom. Basically, Jesus was saying, these Gentiles have more faith than you all do. They believe me. You don't believe me. And if you don't think that's clear, if you think that's a little too vague and I'm pushing it, go look at Luke chapter 13 and verse 23. Luke chapter 13 and verse 23. The life is more than meat and the body more than raiment. Consider the ravens. Uh, I don't know if I'm in the right spot here. Jump down to... 31. No, I think I'm in the wrong passage. Oh, no, 13. I'm in chapter 12. Yeah, chapter 13, verse 23. Sorry about that. Then said one unto him, Lord, are there few that be saved? And he said unto them, Strive to enter in at the straight gate. For many, I say unto you, will seek to enter in and shall not be able. When once the master of the house is risen up and has shut to the door, and ye began to stand without and to knock at the door, saying, Lord, Lord, open unto us, and he shall answer and say unto you, I know you not whence ye are. Then shall ye begin to say, We have eaten and drunk in thy presence, and thou hast taught in our streets. But he shall say, I tell you, I know you not whence ye are. Depart from me, all ye workers of iniquity. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth, when ye shall see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God and you yourselves thrust out. And they shall come from the east and from the west and from the north and from the south and shall sit down in the kingdom of God. And behold, there are last which shall be first and there are first which shall be last. Once again, telling them, you're going to see it, but you're not going in. You're going to be thrust out. And those from the surrounding countries, just like He said in Matthew, they will come into the kingdom. Because there will be many that be the last shall be first. The last was us. And the first, which was them. God's going to the Jew first. They're last. Pretty clear. Jesus said it. They're not going. The remnant will. The elect. There will be some, but it will be a small number. It will be a small minority. It will be the chosen ones. Why they chose? They're chosen because they got saved. Had nothing to do with them being Jewish or descendants of Abraham. The remnant will of them will, and they will include only those who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Romans chapter eleven and verse five. Let me read a verse to you there. Romans chapter eleven and verse five. Even so, then at this present time. Also, there is a remnant according to the election of grace. There was a remnant. Paul was a part of that remnant. He he was it. He was he was a part of it. So, basically, the saved are God's chosen people. And so, well, you know, let's look. Let's go to the very end of the Bible. Let's go to the very end of the Bible. See what it says. And I don't know what you're going to do about this. Say, no, we can't call ourselves the chosen ones. We're not the chosen one. Look at Revelation chapter 17, verse 14. These shall make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb shall overcome them, for He is Lord of lords and King of kings. And they that are with Him are called and chosen and faithful. Now let me ask you, are we with Him today? Are we with Him? Well, then we know what the Bible says we're chosen. If we are against Him... Well, that would be to be against this anti-right, antichrist. Who is an antichrist? A liar. Who's a liar? He that denieth that Jesus is a Christ. If you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ today, you are chosen. We see that all the way in the book of Revelation. We are chosen. The, who are these chosen? Those are the ones coming back with Him on white horses in Armageddon. Who are they going to include? It's going to include all the chosen. And that's going to be Old Testament and New Testament saints. Those who believed, a lot of them are going to be Jews from the Old Testament. But 
It had nothing to do with their genealogy. It was all had to do with whether or not they believed and we are all chosen. We have not replaced the Jews. We got, we got grafted in with them. We are, we are with them. We are a part of the chosen people. And if you are Jewish and happen, if you, or if you're saved and happen to be Jewish, yes, you are one of the chosen. But if you are a Gentile and you are saved, yes, you are the chosen too. You received the promise of Abraham. God will bless them that bless you and curse them that curse you. You are a part of that. The saved are God's chosen people. So what have we been chosen for? Well, the same thing that we looked at before, but also we've been chosen to spread the Gospel, haven't we? Jesus, Who did He tell? He told the saved. He didn't tell the lost to go do it. He told the saved to go. We are chosen for a purpose. We're supposed to be a holy nation, a peculiar people. We're supposed to spread the Gospel. We have been chosen to keep His commandments. And being chosen, it comes with some responsibility. Go to Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3 real quick. We're almost done. Romans chapter 3. Unless you want all my bonus points. It says, What advantage then hath the Jew or what profit is there of circumcision? Much every way, chiefly because that unto them were committed the oracles of God. You know why the Jews were so special? Because they were the ones that God gave His law to. He gave them Genesis through Deuteronomy. It was them that he, he gave them the prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, them guys. They were all Jews. God gave them the word of God God. That's why they were special. That's why they were chosen. But here's the thing. Look at what Luke chapter twelve, verse forty eight says. Luke chapter twelve and verse forty eight says, but he that knew not and did commit things worthy of stripes shall be beaten with few stripes. For unto whomsoever much is given, of him shall be much required. And to whom men have committed much, of him will they ask the more. You know why they were special? Because they've been given so much. He gave them the Word of God. It was them that He allowed to pass through the Red Sea. It was them He brought out of Egypt. It was them that He fed manna with in the wilderness. It was them He showed all those miracles to. And it was them He gave the oracles of God. And what did they do with it? They, they didn't obey it. They rejected the Messiah. And now today, He's given us the Great Commission. He's given us the completed Word of God and just being chosen today, folks, that's not something we get to do and walk around with our chest out and brag, wow, we're the chosen ones. Wow, we're really something. No, that's a, that's a big responsibility, folks. Because we're the chosen ones, we were chosen. God did not choose us so we can just give Him good company in heaven. God didn't choose us just because He wanted to hear our lovely voices calling out to Him in prayer all the time. He chose us for a purpose. He chose us to bring forth fruit to spread the Gospel. And that's what we're supposed to do. We are supposed to spread the Gospel. So this is pretty foreign to what we're hearing in this area. So I mean, how did this happen? How did we get it wrong? Well, I don't know the history of how this made it into Baptist teaching. I don't know. I haven't been around that long. But I like to get my answers from the Bible. And I think we can find the answer of how it got into Baptist church in Acts chapter 15. I'm not going to take time to read Acts chapter 15, but if you remember, there was some disputing going on because there were some Pharisees that got saved. And they started teaching that you had to be circumcised to go to heaven. You know what? They got saved, but they wanted to bring some of their old customs and things in. And I really believe that just like back then, converted Jews brought, were bringing a lot of the same stuff. And, and there's, there's a lot of Jews at first that didn't, or a lot of yeah, you know, a lot of Jewish Christians that didn't want to preach to the Gentiles. They had some disputes over that. You know, and Peter told them, that, "Hey, no, Gentiles are getting saved too. They're receiving the gift of the Holy Ghost too." I believe that it's been converted Jews that have brought it over. They've wanted to hold on to that. Hey, yeah, we got saved. Yeah, you're right. Jesus is the Messiah. But you know what? We're still the chosen people. And okay, <laughs> we didn't challenge them on the Bible. You know, they had to challenge them. Then they had to fight them on. It. And I don't know. You know, it's we. You know, because you know, we love seeing Jewish people get saved. It's exciting. It's like uh, we don't want to offend them. We don't want to run them off. But we've got to stand strong on doctrine. And I believe that it was 
converted Jews that brought it in. So I'm not saying there's anything sinister about it. It's just kind of human nature. People want to bring in their old practices. But just real quick, I'm going to read these bonus verses and I'm done. These are bonuses. This is all bonus. Romans 2.28 For he is not a Jew which is one outwardly. Neither is that circumcision which is outward in the flesh. But he is a Jew which is one inwardly. And the circumcision is that of the heart and the spirit and not in the letter whose praise is not of men but of God. So they're not even Jews, the Bible says. We are. We are. We're the chosen people. We're the Jews. That's what the Bible says. I, I'm sorry. It's right there. Romans. We, we just read it. He is not a Jew. Romans 9.6 Not as though the Word of God had taken none effect, for they are not all Israel which are of Israel. Neither because they are the seed of Abraham are they all children. But in Isaac shall they be called. That is, they which are the children of the flesh. These are not the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted for the seed. And that's talking about us too. We're Israel, folks. We are of the nation of Israel. And here's this question. If the Jews are the bride of Christ, or if the church is the bride of Christ, and the Jews are the bride of God, then did Jesus have to pay for the sins of the Jews on the cross? And if Jesus if, did Jesus purchase God's bride? So if Jesus or did Jesus not die for the Jews? Then would that mean if if Jesus didn't die for the Jews, would that mean there's another way to the Father? By genetics? Now you all know that's not true. But that's pretty much if we say that Jews are the bride of God and Christians are the bride of Christ then Jesus bought God's bride. Well, that's not the way it's supposed to work. Well, it counts because He was God too. So it was Jesus died on the cross and God on the cross and God was paying for the Jews and Jesus was paying for the Christians. Well, then who was it that turned His back? <laughs> and why did Jesus say, My God, My God, why I thought saving me? It was all Jesus there on the cross. Titus 3.9 But avoid foolish questions and genealogies and contentions and strivings about the law, for they are unprofitable in vain. Why aren't we supposed to talk about genealogies? Isn't the Bible full of genealogies? It is. But we thought the genealogy, the only the reason the Old Testament is full of genealogies is basically showing the genealogy to Christ. And after Christ there are no more genealogies. You know why? Because the only genealogy that matters is Christ. Are you in Christ? We're not Mormons today. We don't have to spend hours and hours and days and days studying our genealogy, tracing it all the way back to Adam so we can figure out you know, where we stand in the scheme of things. That, no, that's not what it's about. It doesn't matter. If you believe in Christ today, it doesn't matter if your dad was a Jew, a Mormon, a drunkard, an atheist. It's, are, are you in Christ? It has nothing to do with family. And don't let anybody deceive you. If you are saved today, you are God's chosen people. I am one of the chosen ones. I don't say that bragging. I say that with great fear because there's a responsibility that comes with being the chosen. I'm supposed to love God. I'm supposed to keep His commandments. I'm supposed to give the Gospel. And then if you're saved today, that's you too. So with that, let's all stand together.